Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Jake Thomas is originally from New Orleans, Louisiana, and his passion for personal service stems from being a United States Marine. He has proudly leveraged that, among a plethora of other experiences, into a career of helping people satisfy some of the most basic human needs, health, happiness, and wealth. Jake has an incredible story of healing through food and alcohol addiction and a journey of running away from the present moment. As he worked on himself, he avoided focusing on the result and instead focused on the steps and learned to appreciate the process. By truly prioritizing his health, he has learned to manifest thoughts into reality. Put simply, the process of resculpting his mind and body saved his life. It has enabled him to lead family, friends, and total strangers on similar paths, and nothing on this earth has given him more satisfaction than positively impacting the lives of other people. In 2017, Jake founded Life Like Jake, an elite mindset training program that puts candidates through a rigorous unplugging to rewire their thought processes and understanding of the world as they see it and of life itself. Doing so produces autonomous beings who are principle-based and purpose-driven, able to harness the power of the universe to enact the change in their lives they so deeply desire. Jake Thomas, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Casey. I'm stoked to be here, and it's really cool to hear all that uh, being read. I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely blushing uh, from the <laughs> intro, so thanks a lot. Well, you've done a lot of cool stuff and definitely deserve to be here. My number one question for you is, where is your mom? I actually wanted to talk to your mom and not you. I don't know how this got switched <laughs> at the last minute. Where was the miscommunication? I don't want to hang out with you. She, uh, fair, fair play, fair question. She's, uh, she's somewhere around. Uh, I think she was in San Antonio for the day, so she's uh, off doing her own thing, but I'll definitely let her know. Um, (laughs) You're not the first person to say that to me. Also, funnily enough, like, hey, it's good to see you, but where's your mom? (laughs) (laughs) Totally. Normally, I would only ask to get a rise out of my hockey buddies or whatever, but I I had to ask uh, you about her because I got to meet not only you in person, but her as well. Um, These conferences are amazing, and it's really cool to go and see our heroes and the people that we look up to, to meet new people, but you also tend to hang out with the, the kind of people that you're really drawn to. And so I spent the entire weekend hanging out with James Lehman and Tony Pascola, yeah. two of my really good friends. Last year, it was hanging out with Matt and Robin Dobbins and the NSNG crew. And it's just people, you know, kind of like us that are just seeking the truth and trying to get a good message out there. And you just get a really, really good sense of like genuine people out there, people doing good content who have found something very different and they're trying to help people on that path. And not only did I notice that from you and hanging out with you, um, I noticed that with your mom who was just an absolute sweetheart. And I'm so grateful for the time that we all get to sit at the same table in Austin and have some great barbecue and really visit about all of our stories. Pretty cool. Yeah, that was, that was great. Um, You know, she, was laughing she's like wow you really want to take me i was like of course i want to take you mom like this is awesome it's our kind of thing together you know she gave me the the luxury of being born or the opportunity to be born and uh a lot of my kind of delving into this just a war path of of health consciousness and prioritization is really attributed to her you know like we kind of i think we talked about it briefly but my mother was given like a death sentence a few years ago with uh, a year to live uh, following a very not great uh, 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 calcium scan, bone density scan. Um, just had a crazy early onset of osteoporosis and was essentially told that her bones were very brittle and she would crack like glass if she were to fall. So like basically saying, if you take a fall, it's going to be a steep decline in your overall health and likely something that's going to you know end up seeing you terminate a lot sooner than you'd like to. And I was like, yeah, not on my fucking watch. <laughs> and so I took that as like a big opportunity to say, hey, get yourself in check. I needed to do it anyway myself uh, where I was in life at the time and uh, really just took this uh, as a, you know, hey, if I don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. And this is my family. This is the person I care about that cares the most about me. So that's what really put me on that that war path. And then, yeah, she seemed like the perfect person to bring to that because she's geeking out the same way that I am and meeting people. And then she ended up being a great photographer at the same time and didn't even realize it until she was just like, Hey, let me take your picture. Let me take your picture. And then I looked through the album. I'm like, mom, you killed it. Like you got all these photos that I wouldn't have taken had you not been there. We had a lot of laughs, good times. Like you said, it was awesome to sit and eat with everybody and share stories and, and get to know one another um, yourself, of course. And like sharing kinships with, with cycling, you know, that was awesome to talk about too. Uh, but yeah, it was just a good time man. like minds. Uh, at the same time, hearing people with uh, conflicting opinion, 
you know, hearing from the other side of, of the table, their arguments, their beliefs and being like, wow, okay. Some people still really believe this way and being able to kind of take a little bit from, from each field. And yeah, it was a really cool weekend. I'm glad we got to connect for yeah, sure. Definitely. Those are my favorite moments of those conferences, the conference itself, pretty cool. And again, good people, good presentations, lots of vendors, um, that kind of thing. That, that part was great, but it's, it, it's that communion of us like sitting together and having the dinner and everybody's stories and thinking, you know, Adrian Gledhill was there and she'd been on the biggest loser and she's yeah. on her incredible weight loss journey. And just everybody has a story and just to sit there and absorb it all was quite cool. Um, I did on the note of like being, you know, different information, I guess I, being somebody who came to the conference, who was like just brand new to this world, I would have left feeling a little bit confused. And I hope mm. anybody who left there feeling confused can get some coaching, get some help with some things because you would go to one presentation and it was like, you need to make sure you're eating tons of fat. The next presentation was like, you're eating too much fat. You need to eat more protein. The next one was like, ah, oh, you need greens for your eyesight is really good for you. And so there was a yeah. lot of like conflicting information. And on the one hand, I really love loved and appreciate that there was a lot of different things. But again, for somebody who had just started in this way of life, it, it, that can be a little bit tricky in the beginning. True. Fair, fair point. I, I agree. I remember sitting there talking to you, talking with you about that because we were watching, you know, Speaker X, cool, 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 taking our notes, then Speaker Y, cool, 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 taking our notes, Speaker Z, and then comparing those notes and be like, well, he said this, she said that. They both disagree here. They both are totally get what you're coming from, get where you're coming from. And I agree. Um, thing that I took away the most, man, you know, on the first day when we went there, I, I didn't say anything about it. I just observed it on my own. And then the second day, the same thing was taking place. And the third day, the same thing was taking place. And I said it to my mother on the second day. I said, mom, do you notice of all the lines in here of things to do, you know, whether it's to try out a biohacking thing or to sample something or meet someone, get an autograph, take a video, partake in an IV or a massage gun. I was like, do you know what the longest line in here is for? And she's like, what, what? I was like, food. Yep. Every single day. I don't know. You guys saw it too. You know, everybody was in line for that smoked sausage or the bacon, delicious food. Don't get me wrong. But every single day, everybody was in line for food. The longest lines of that conference day in and day out every day. And then during those talks, like you mentioned, some people are saying eat more fat, eat more of this, eat more of that. I would have told pretty much 90% of the people in there, eat less, fast more, lift heavy, mm. period. Yep. Like you want to know what's truly going to be the best thing for you, but like to like sit in there and look at people that were sitting down eating while they're sitting, while they're watching these. I'm not being a judge nor a critic, but I'm not a doctor either. or don't need to be a doctor to say like, you don't need to be eating. Yeah. For most of the people that were sitting there watching and, and attending, it's like, you don't need to be eating, period. You want to, sure, we all like to do it. But the overarching ammo that I think is understated is that we just overconsume in general, everything, not just food, but for sure, food. And there we are at this conference trying to learn about metabolic health, low carb, healing, eating and living, ancestral dieting and lifestyles. And yet, consumption was the main you know attraction for for most of the people there of which the majority of those people would have benefited greatly from not doing that and there was not one maybe one i mean dr dr berg at the end you know he's pretty big on talking about fasting a lot but like so much other talk and discussion was about what supplements what things you need to take exogenously what foods to prioritize and i was just like you know, and especially to your question about having kind of just got into the realm a little bit and like, which way do I go? I want to make it real simple for you. You want to get healthier. You want to feel better within your mind. You want to have more energy. You want to be more physically fit, more metabolically healthy, have your body being able to operate more efficiently without as much drag or effort to do so. Eat less, fast more, lift heavy, period. Love that. I absolutely love that. Yeah, I think that advice could have helped a lot of people there. And again, not to say, you know, who is right and who is wrong or whatever, just that it was a little complicated, especially for somebody who is just getting started at that conference. Um, we, we still have a long way to go. You know what I mean? Like we're in a culture where you don't have to be uncomfortable. You don't have to experience discomfort or temperatures or sunlight mm -hmm. or, you know, workouts that suck. You know, you can stay in exactly the same climate controlled area from the moment you wake up and get in your car and drive to work and come home and food is available everywhere. 
everywhere. Like everywhere you go, everywhere. it's it's so hard. And so I understand that it can be a challenge for people, but I think by keeping that advice so simple, I think it does help a lot of people. I do just want to say too, I really respected and appreciated your approach to the conference. A lot of us who go were like, ah, there's so many vendors, not really our thing, and they're doing biohacky stuff and like whatever. Like I, I like it, I don't love it. I'm I'm not I'm gonna kind of like avoid that area unless I just want to go cruise around and go find whoever I can find. And you were like, screw that. Like, I'm going to go and do every single one of these things that these people offer. And you took full advantage of that. I'm like, maybe I should rethink my strategy. That was pretty cool. It, it was fun. Like the first day was a lot of, you know, shaking hands, kissing cheeks, meeting people. That was awesome, you know, and just walking the floor. And just like you said, kind of bumping into whoever, seeing who's around, uh, just getting the lay of the land. But the second day, Went there for the morning discussions and presentations. And then during lunch, I went for a run. And it was pretty hot that weekend in Austin. Went for a run and uh, finishing the run around town. And I was like, man, I'm just going to go into the center and get in the cold plunge, get an IV, get a little massage gun, whatever else is available, any other modality that I can you know, get my hands on kind of thing and enjoy. I'm going to make use of that. And I did. And it was great. And the people that were hosting and providing those things were also like, oh, yeah, man, absolutely. Like, everybody was super into it because I was, you know, I don't want to say perfect, but like I was a great candidate to make use to what they were offering, like the IV. I mean, I, I just finished a 14 mile run. It's like hit me with a doc. You know, it's like this is perfect. Before that, like I just kicked off my shoes, took off my socks, got right in the tub from from being outside. I was, you know, sweating up a thousand degrees and everything. It was, it was perfect to be in there. Hey, massage gun. Awesome. Go, go nuts. Uh, tens unit, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Put them all over my body. It was, it was really cool. And like I said, the people were so excited to, I think, work with me because I was really excited because I was in need, you know, I was essentially like, I don't want to say desperate, but I was like, please, whatever you got, I'm willing and able to, to do any and all of it. So it was, it was a good, uh, yeah. I was just in the in the right right state of mind, I think, to, to really appreciate everything. Well, yeah, that was great. Like I said, you made me rethink my whole approach to the whole thing. So I'm glad you were able to do that and report back on that. <laughs> that was pretty great. Oh, man. So let's go back and deep dive into your story a little bit more. Um, as we said in the introduction, and you have already alluded to in this conversation, you had to go through quite a bit in your life, a lot of healing, uh, a lot of running away from the present moment. Tell us how you got yourself into such a deep pit. Yep. Um, I left home when I was 17 or yeah, 17 to go enlist in the Marine Corps. Um, home life, my um, parents got divorced when I was very young and I grew up with my father uh, marrying the woman that he had an affair with uh, behind my mother's back and basically all of my childhood friends growing up, assuming these were my parents or that she was my mother. My mother was never really in the picture because she was forced out just legally and, and affluentially by my father, unfortunately. And um, I had this big divide in my family life to where I'd never had my mother, my, my real mother in the picture to look up to, to understand or to draw, you know, maternal understandings or, or feminine understandings from. My father taught me, you know, things about sports and how to tune in race cars and cool stuff, but nothing about being a gentleman or really about being a, a respectable man, I would say. So I had these these voids in my life that I didn't know were really there, but I was just kind of confused because I never had, you know, I never introduced a girlfriend to my mother as a kid. I never got to, you know, we're getting ready for prom. Like, hey, mom, check me out. See how I look. My mother, you know, I played soccer my entire life. My mother never saw me play. Little, these things that were just weird to me, but I just kind of went through. So on the outside, it looks great suburbia you know upper middle class white suburbia goes to catholic school like it's all good and hunky dory i uh, i think it was a great camouflage and awesome disguise to where the marine corps was like a an attraction to me i was like oh my god give me that this would be way cooler than where i'm currently at right now get dirty you know play with guns blow shit up sounded awesome and I needed some leadership. I knew I needed something in my life like I wasn't doing well in school I was trying to go to undergrad I wasn't into it. I wasn't going to class. I was smoking a bunch of weed and just, I didn't really have any direction or a sense of purpose uh, in any regard. Like I was just like getting high and, you know, doing hood rat shit with my friends. And so when I got into the Marine Corps, I definitely found a sense of purpose. I found a, a sense of mission. Uh, I was able to adopt an identity. I created this character 
you know, but that I was embodying at the same time. And it just gave me this sense of fulfillment that I didn't have in life before that. Every day I had this understanding of mission. You know, you put the uniform on, it's like, for the most part, you pretty much know what you're doing. You know what your purpose is. You know what your, your day's tasks are. You know exactly what you need to do, where you need to be, and even how you need to do it. It felt pretty good because I never had that. I never had such structure and prideful structure in my life before. And so that really gave me this whole new understanding of personal discipline, self-reliance, all these leadership traits that I didn't have, but I found them there and I was like, wow, this is, this is awesome. And I thought I was going to do that forever. But I did my four years, got out. And then once I got out, I was like, oh, I lost this identity. Or, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but that's what the a new void was. Now I didn't have that same sense of mission and what am I doing and where do I go? And, you know, I get up and just do what I want now. So I was kind of lost back in society. People talk differently. I acted differently. My understanding of time and punctuality was different than theirs and how to do things and the manner in which I would do them too. And the attention to details that I would have, it made interpersonal relationships very difficult, romantic relationships, very difficult, uh, tolerances, patiences with people, just little things that I didn't foresee as being difficult to transition with, but ended up being very much so and still can be to, to the day because I'll still always have this heightened sense of of discipline and go-getterness that I feel to be a very important character trait for me. You know, just like somebody saying the, the Swiss are the most, you know, timely and punctual people in the world. Duh. It's like, well, Jake is always going to be assertive. Jake is always going to be direct. He's going to be disciplined. Like I'm going to, I'm going to have those character traits till I die with pride, but understanding at first how to kind of throttle them. And then not everything's life and death with your friends or your girlfriend for that matter, because she was late for something or your friends told you one thing and the plans changed. And no, Jake, you can't flip the fuck out over that because things are going to happen. People change. There's, you know, unforeseen circumstances that take place and this is not always life and death. So I had to learn to um, deprogram and unwire from that. And I didn't understand how to do that a lot and very well at the beginning. So I drank. And I used because drinking was my way of coping and tolerating and feeling okay and being able to hide that persona or hide from the persona that I felt that I lost. You know, now I'm back on the block. I'm just Jake again. I'm not the Marine anymore. Like, uh, like uh, I don't have that sense of mission and purpose and didn't get to do what I wanted in the career sense. And I didn't get to go to all the places I wanted to go to. And I wish I had this, like some regret, maybe some wish I could have, you know, should have, would have stuff. And then now I'm back here and I'm, working at a bar because it's feeding my need to drink and it's allowing me to kind of socially camouflage in one way. But all I was doing was really just hiding pain and confusion. Uh, I had a lot of great friends, don't get me wrong, made, made tons of friends and was always, you know, socially active and a, and a big butterfly. But I was always running from uh, what I needed to be confronting. And it was finding a sense of self. So like when I say like afraid of the present moment, like, yeah, I was drinking to not be in the present. I was drinking for the sake of escapism, a thousand percent. I was drinking to get inebriated because I did not like feeling the sobering effects of sobriety or sober life. It allowed me to be in an altered state of consciousness and mind because I did not like where I was. I was unhappy. And so I would use alcohol and then later on uh, pretty aggressively uh, cocaine because that was another thing and it would give me this sense of empowerment and, and coolness and a little bit of kind of swagger that I had. And it was also a way to stay um, drunk or longer because I could stay awake by being stimulated. But all of it was about escapism. All of it was about um, self-loathing and just not being happy because I was lost and I didn't feel right in the world. And I had to go through that for a long time. It was a period of probably like 10 years that I did that for hard. Uh, just in and out, in and out, asleep, awake, asleep, awake, you know, up for days, passed out, sleeping all day, waking up, you know, waking up at night like a vampire, uh, afraid of the sun all the time, even though I was always tan. Because, I mean, I loved being in the sun, but I didn't like waking up. Uh, I, I just, I was such a night, a, a creature of the night. And it was always because I was trying to run from things. I was never trying to confront them. I was cowardice and I was afraid and just uh, weak mentally and emotionally. And it took a lot of, not a lot, but several hard close calls between run-ins with the law or 
a loved one, you know, crying and begging and asking girlfriends, same thing, crying, begging and asking multiple girlfriends. Um, but people just, you know, opening themselves up to you and like bearing their souls asking, but it still wasn't enough, right? Because it's gotta be me that would want to make that change and do something about it. The same thing for anyone. It doesn't matter how bad you ask your friend or your father or your whoever to change, to sober up, to get clean, to improve. If they don't want to, like, they're not going to do it. You have to truly want it. And it just, it got to a point where it just wasn't cool to me anymore. It had worn out its, uh, its, 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 its um, appeal. You know, like I wouldn't go out without a bag. Like, I just wouldn't do it. I was so to the point where, like, if I can't go out without, you know, X amount of grams of blow, I just won't do it. There's no, there's no reason for me to. That's not a fun place to be. I won't go out with X group of people until I've had X amount of drinks so I can tolerate their miserable existences. That's a terrible place to be. And that's not them. That's me. You know, like... It's not the world around me. It's me. The world is not as we perceive it. The world is as we are. So like the world is the direct reflection of ourselves back upon us. I did not know this at the time. You know, at the time I was like, everybody's fucked up. You guys are stupid. These people are fucking lame. Blah, 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 blah. You, you, you. Not me, me, me. It was just pointing fingers. And I would use all those things to hide and tolerate, like I said, the existences of, of other people. But eventually it just got old and I started to see what my circle, my social circles were turning into who I was hanging out with, what they were doing professionally. And I just, I didn't see that going anywhere either. I was exactly where I deserved to be based on the decisions I made, uh, the choices I made and the actions that I took. And it wasn't where I wanted to be. So little by little, I started crawling out of that place, but it took, you know, a couple of bumps on the bottom to really make me go, okay, it's time to push off the top and figure this out. That's quite the story. I really appreciate your authenticity. How were you able to dig yourself out and how did um, nutrition and fitness come into the picture of something that would eventually help you? Well, it wasn't just like one push. I'm like, okay, cool. We're going for it. You know, like I, I kept going back. I kept going back. Like I would make some ground and then be like, all right, let me dabble. Let me dabble a little bit again make some ground. Okay. Well, maybe I can still have this in my life or them or go there, you know, whatever. And it never, it would never hit home. Like example. Okay. Maybe I, I won't do blow all the time, but maybe just once a month or once a week, you know, like, and I was just trying to give myself these, these outs of tolerance. But the more I went without those substances or the poisons or the impurities or the people, the better I felt, the more I prioritized, you know, these little bits of introspection and, and positive internal dialogue and learning to meditate, which I never did before. And when I first started doing it, I couldn't even do it for two minutes, literally. Um, and I'm very competitive and I don't like being good at things. So not being able to meditate for two minutes really pissed me off. So it was something that I like buried myself into. I was like, okay, we're, we're going to figure this out. We're going to, we're going to learn how to do this. But nonetheless, I was so rah, unable to, to sit in that meditative state for two minutes. Cause I was just so wired and convoluted and warped around in my, my head, you know, but each one of these things I started to take up, you know, reading more. I never read books in my life. I hated to read as a kid. I cheated on every reading and literature exam all throughout school. Um, you know, middle school and high school, I would just get the Cliff's Notes, download whatever I could, listen to audiobooks. I just hated to read. So I would cheat on all of it. I started reading. I started doing things I didn't like doing, basically. I never meditated. I didn't like doing it. So I started meditating. I never read. I hated fucking reading. I started reading. Um, I run well, but I was never a runner. I started running a lot and pushing myself when I did that to where you know, it's one thing for me to kind of run at a steady, a steady pace, but to run aggressively with tempo, like basically just doing many things that I did not like to do. And the more I did those things, the more it seemed to fill these, these voids in my soul. And I started to have different thoughts, better thoughts. I started to, to just feel differently. And absolutely at the foundation of all that was my nutrition, was what I was putting into my mouth. And that took a lot of time because I got to delve into a lot of different realms. You know, I grew up, my mother 
did her best when she was around me, but she was gone, um, you know, out of my life from, from a pretty young age. Um, but her teachings were impressed on me then. So like I was doing my best as a kid to like eat well and by eat well, I mean like eating whole foods, but I was still subject to a lot of the, you know, same things other people are in the form of a standard American diet and process this and that and pre made package frozen and whatnot meals. But as I started to really kind of feel better on my own, I started to push back to what I'd learned as a kid. Like, hey, eat things that are that you can pick, pull, or kill, right? Things that don't come in boxes, boxes, packages, and wrappers. Okay, cool. And I started dating a girl that was pretty conscious of her own health. And I was, you know, taking pages from her book. Okay, she doesn't do this. Cool, I'm going to try that too. And then it was actually girlfriends that really got me more dietarily conscious. You know, one girlfriend was a vegetarian. All right, cool. One girl was a pescatarian. All right, cool. One girlfriend didn't consume dairy. Like, okay, cool. I'll try that too. And, you know, eventually I ended up becoming a vegetarian myself, dating one of the girls. And then she and I became vegans ourselves. And we did that for like a year plus of each one of those. So like a year plus vegetarian, a year plus vegan. But it was all out of just like exploration and curiosity. But doing each of those, yeah, I felt better and better. Like the more I prioritized my nutrition, the more everything else felt better too. The more everything else improved, whether it was, you know, my depression going away or just at least seeming to subside or improving. Um, sleep issues. Sleep is always a, a shit thing for me because I, I would say that in the military, no matter where you serve, any branch or whatever you, you know, whatever job you do, you get great sleep. People can be like, what? That's ridiculous. You get terrible sleep. Yes, but you also get great sleep because you've never been so tired for some of the sleep that you do get. You go through the most adverbial extremes in the military. You're the, the happiest, the saddest, the coldest, the hottest, the wettest, the driest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You learn the, the most adverbial extremes of human condition. So like the sleep that you get because you're the most tired you've ever been in your life, it's like amazing. And then the sleep that you don't get because it's just impossible to sleep when you're trying to, it's like, oh, this sucks. But you get this new understanding of like range for that. And when I got out, a big part of my difficulties with sleep and just feeling okay was I, I, I was like chasing that demon of deep, deep, exhausted sleep. But it wasn't about being fatigued. I learned that it was about feeling wholesome because I would go to bed at night knowing what I was doing, knowing that I had a purpose, knowing that I'd served, I'd done my duty. You know, like I, 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 I could go to sleep like, ah, today I earned it. And I was missing that in life once I got out. Didn't, again, realize this until years later. And I was like, oh, bingo. And so as I started eating well and feeling better, thinking better, having more, you know, selfless, positively focused thoughts, meditating, doing things that were not what I wanted to do, you know, getting comfortable being uncomfortable, leaning into discomfort, consciously seeking suffering for personal growth. I started to have a sense of fulfillment. I started to feel like I, hey, man, I earned my sleep today because damn it, like I got up and I thought out loud, how can I better serve the world today? How can I be an improvement from yesterday? Like just literally thinking like that, you know, but I wouldn't think that way in the past because my mind was so convoluted with poison. All my creativity, belief, wonder, and awe in childhood, just mysticism was fucking destroyed from all the poison that I was putting into myself. All the depression, the self-loathing, the fear, the skepticism, like all the negative thoughts that come from impurity were suppressing all that. And that was shutting out and silencing my like real potential to, to shine. And so each of those things I kind of touched on were ways that it started to bring that out. And absolutely at the foundation of it was nutrition. And I would have never thought that yeah, at so, the beginning. So how... We know that you were quite successful with physical endeavors when you were vegetarian, when you were vegan, you weren't always doing the same thing. You were adapting as you were going. Now we know that you are a carnivore. 
how, how did that come about? If you were already succeeding in certain ways as a vegan, what made you think that doing a carnivore diet would benefit you at all? Great question. Because <laughs> because I went from being a vegan to carnivore, which is hilarious. Um, I never so I never did. Uh, I was never a vegetarian nor a vegan for any ethical reasons or like morality or you know animal rights activism or anything like that. Um, like I was saying earlier, it came from my girlfriends. Like it came from girls I dated. Like I dated a vegetarian, so I was like, yeah, sure, I'll I'll do it with you, babe. Like no no worries, cool. I, I'm man, whatever. I can I, in my mind, I'm like I'm I'm fucking trash compactor. I can eat anything and make it happen. And then at the same time, I was like, this stuff's healthy. Like, sure. It's not like, it's not like we're saying, Hey, let's become fast food addicts together. You know, like we were, we were shopping and like, Hey, this is some nice lettuce. That's a nice sweet potato. Like I was like, in my mind, I still had this innate belief and now understanding that like, this is not unhealthy per se. It's not like we're saying, Hey, we're going to be Wendy's fanatics, you know, or we're going to only eat, you know, highly processed and refined, you know, highly processed foods and, and, and GMO, everything like we weren't saying that. And so I had a pretty good understanding of what I thought to be, you know, healthy food. And yes, I had success in, in, in bodybuilding as a standard American diet or as a bro diet, or if it fits your macros as a plant-based eater and as a vegan against all odds. And what all the naysayers were saying, it was impossible. No, it's not. You just, you take the right supplements. It's fine. And I did that naturally, by the way. I was never uh, one to partake in any PDs or banned substances, TRT, HGH, or any of that shit. I uh, competed in the, the WNBF, the World Natural Bodybuilding Federation, proudly. And as a vegan, but like I said, there's a lot of pills and powders and just supplements to make that happen. So when a good friend of mine talked to me or first pitched at me the carnivore diet, I was like, what? Because... I just a few months prior finished my final uh, competition as a natural bodybuilder and I'd done pretty well. Like I finished third in the world in, in men's open physique. I was pretty, pretty policed, you know, pretty proud, a lot of ego there. And so when this friend best, one of my best friends on earth guy I served with in the Marine Corps and I love him to death, like a brother. He's like, man, you should check this out. And I'm like, mm, I'm pretty sure I'm the one with the, the, the medal around my neck that says world champion, not you motherfucker, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I was like, why don't you go fucking, you know, take some of your own advice before you give it to me. Um, so that was kind of a laugh at first, but he kept just going like, dude, you got to check this out. Read this, watch this, listen to this, read this, watch this, listen to this. I'm like, man, I know what keto is. Like I've done that already. He's like, no, 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 dude, just meat and animal products. I was like, okay. What? Really? Like just that? You sure? And he's like, yes, man, read this, watch this, listen to this. Okay, fine. So I did. So I started reading, watching and listening. And it just started, it started making sense. Because again, the same thing that when I was a vegetarian, of what things didn't necessarily, I never had a, a voice telling me this is wrong. Okay. In the sense that I'm eating things that are grown in the land, grown from the earth naturally. I'm not like trying to create some fucked up diet with a bunch of, you know, chemically made compounds and, and dyes and, and whatnots that would have registered an error in my mind. But even as a vegetarian, even as a vegan, and when I was a, like, you know, trying it as a raw vegan for me, I was like, maybe it's not the best thing for me, but I was like, this isn't like it's poison. I'm not ingesting poison. I'm still consuming whole, real, natural food. What is it? Uh, macronutriently deficient or micronutriently deficient, minerally, vitaminally, like probably. But still, I was like, I'm not consuming poison. I know this is true, real food. But when I was pitched the idea of the carnivore diet, now I started thinking about, okay, this would be no supplements. That sounds really good to me because I had like a cabinet of supplements. You know, I'm taking, you know, vegan protein powder and all these different amino acids that don't exist, you know, in the plant kingdom that have to be sourced exogenously. Um, all these little pills and powders. I mean, I was taking like, you know, 20, 30 pills a day. I'm like 30 years old at the time. I'm like, I don't need to be, what the fuck am I having like a, a you know, 10 sleeve pill box with and where I've got to take like, you know, 10 pills five times. So I'm like, this is like, this can't be right. 
So when I first read that about no supplements, I was like, that sounds like a great thing to me because I take way too many now. And it's this you know, ridiculous amount of money that I spend to get all these things. And then reading about micronutrient profiles and understanding minerals, you know, like three easy ways to think about it. Calories are going to determine what you weigh. Macronutrients will determine what you look like and micronutrients will determine how you feel. I like that. So that's good. I'm stealing like that. Sim simple stuff, right? Simple stuff. Um, so there, there's another takeaway for you. Like Beautiful. if you could have just heard that, you'd be like, hmm, that was a big help. This is good. <laughs> so I started just to compare things grossly. So gross, most gross, big picture, calories. Okay. Calories from the plants and the vegan foods compared to calories from the carnivore foods and thinking about bioavailability. What, you know, am I going to retain or be able to utilize from what I'm ingesting? And like, you know, in the plant world, a lot of the bioavailability is not nearly as high nor optimal as it would be from an animal or an animal byproduct because there are husks. There are things that our bodies have to digest, break down in order to extract nutrients, things they have to get through, you know, phylum and, and cellulose and whatnot before they can actually get those nutrients. So like we might consume something yay big, but by the time we get what we need out of it, it's just this little like pee and everything else is just kind of roughage and, you know, materialistic flair, if you want to call it that. And so I started thinking like, yeah, it's true. You know, I was having four, sometimes five bowel movements a day as a vegan bodybuilder. To me, I'm thinking, oh, it's because my metabolism's high. I'm, I'm eating a heavy, you know, protein, heavy food, da, 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 da. No, Jake, that's all waste. All that evacuation is your body saying, we don't need any of this. It might have tasted great for you. This was a good vessel for them to serve it to you in in order to get into the body. But look, we just had to look at all this and go, mm, we just need that little bit. And the rest of this is going out the back door. Because when I started on a carnivore diet, man, I, I would have like sometimes bowel movements once a week. And I was like, oh my God, this is a trip. And at first I'm like, ah, what's wrong? I'm constipated. Da, da, da. No, not constipated. No issues in the colon. There's no cancer. There's nothing wrong in your intestines, large or small. It's your body totally absorbing what it's ingesting, making full utilization of all that. Not having to evacuate and say, we don't need this because we can't use it. We can't break it down. I wasn't having four to five bowel movements a day. I would have, if, if I would have, and even now, like one, it's like, and that was a huge uh, eureka moment to me on top of not having to take all these pills and powders and, and other supplements and just be like, God, I can get all this just from steak or just from bacon and egg. And they take all this other stuff to create this look and feel. What's the opportunity cost there? I was spending so much time in preparation, so much time in calculation, so much time in consumption, and so much money to do all that. Whereas, yeah, I can go to the freaking store right now and get a dozen eggs and a pound of ground beef, and what, what's not even 20 bucks. And that's, that's a day's worth of food right there, of top of the line, most nutrient-dense, all the micros and minerals that I could ask for as far as in vitamins and goodies, for sure, the macros are satisfied. It's like that, maybe not at the supermarket, but if I were to go to one of the farmer's markets, that was plucked and pulled this morning. You know, that bacon was slaughtered the other day and cured. It's, it's about as clean and pure as it gets. And it's as natural as can be as far as, far as in like, that's what God made. That's what the universe made. You know, I look out the window right now and I can see deer uh, walking around the river near where I live. I don't see any watermelons growing there. I don't see any cucumbers hanging around or like, like other stuff. Like if I needed to eat right now, I'd be in that river looking for fish. If I needed to eat right now, I'll tell you what, one of those deer is getting slit open real quick. Yep. So I just started to like look at things in retrospect. Not again that they were wrong. But just to go like, wow, this is a whole nother way. And it seems to make a whole lot more sense in the sense that my modern mind can make sense of veganism. My modern mind can make sense of vegetarianism. My modern Western abundanced lifestyle mind can make sense of those things. But let's go back just 100 years. 
200 years. Are there any vegans anywhere? Any vegetarians anywhere? I mean, I much more so believe those are choices out of abundance and fortunate sets of circumstance, more so they are out of true necessity or dogmatic belief, which what you know people put their loyalties to now. But all that that I never thought I would realize, and that was just the precipice of what adopting this carnivore diet has started to give to me. Yeah, that's amazing. Ben Bickman came on our show, Dr. Ben Bickman came on our show and said that veganism is a diet for the elite. You have to have the mm. money to pull it off and you have to have the education to know where you're going to be nutritionally deficient. And you know, 40, 50 years ago, the supplements didn't exist. Now you can do it for a while at least, but it is a diet for the elite. So I think that's a really good way to frame that. And, and and since going carnivore and being in this space, you have had success in endurance sports as well. Um, I was working on a metabolic cart back in 2012 when it was first introduced to me the concept of fat adaptation, essentially, where if you could take an endurance athlete like myself at the time and feed them more fat and reduce the carbohydrates in their diet – and especially in certain parts of the year, depending on their training load, you could then mm. make their body switch to a fat burning kind of mode where it would preserve carbohydrates. Thus you would, you would postpone or prevent bonking and you could run an, an endurance athlete on fat and, and like understanding that there were triathletes out there that were eating butter and cream and bacon and were competing at the top levels of Ironman triathlon. I'm like, the hell are you guys talking about? This is absurd. I've never heard anything like that. And, and yet it worked time after time after time. And this was still years before I ever found like low carbohydrate or ketogenic diets or eventually, you know, five and a half years ago, finding carnivore diet. Um, can you describe what it's like to compete in endurance sports when you're on a carnivore diet? And then I might have a specific question question about like how you prepare for your events specifically, but like contrast the difference between, you know, playing soccer on a mixed diet, doing, you know, fitness things on and vegan vegetarianism versus doing endurance sport now on carnivore diets. Oh yeah. Great question. Um, and the, the one that's, that's super polarizing, <laughs> um, in, in short, you know, you can only consume about like 2000 or you can only have around 2000 grams of carbs on you in any given moment 2000 like, calories as a yep. human being 2000 calories of carbs i'm sorry yeah, 2000 grams <laughs> 8000 calories 2000 calories of carbs on your person obviously it's probably a little more or less depending on size and, and activity level but that can go pretty quick right and if you tap out of that you have to replenish that reserve simple Whereas fat, no matter how lean you get, you're still going to have body fat. And we're talking like, instead of 2,000, like 100,000 calories, right? To where I'm wearing a suit of energy right now. You are too. Anybody, for the most part that we know in our lives, is also wearing a suit of energy in the form of their own body fat. But that cannot get tapped into unless... All glycogen storages are depleted within the body. All sources of potential carbohydrate deriving energy have been depleted. We got to exhaust those 2000 calories worth of carbs first before we can stress the body enough to get the liver to start producing these ketones. So we're able to drive our fat or derive our energy from our fat sources. But once that happens, it's essentially limitless because how long is it going to take you to go through 100,000 calories of? of fat quite a while quite a while so for an endurance athlete the only thing you have to think about are micronutrients or the minerals you know making sure your electrolytes are in a good balance making sure you're ahead on those because you don't want to get behind because if you get behind you're fucked because you're not going to have quick fast acting carbohydrates to help you right so that's i think I, um, more so a thing that is important for people to understand about ketosis and fat adaptation and endurance training is that you can do it but there's a little bit of volatility that comes with it. There's a lot less room for error because once you get into that fat adapted state, in order to stay there, you can't mix in. You know, if you're if you're cramping up or you're you're feeling fatigued on mile whatever, or does it like you can't drink Gatorade, you can't take honey because now you're going to talk about your body's going to go right to that first and it's going to disrupt your fat adaptation. 
as opposed to you want to stay in that energy state, it's about micronutrients. I use tons of salt to front load with, tons of electrolytes to front load with. Salt, best salt in the world, Baja Gold, shout out. Um, salt that's got electrolytes in it, the most mineral rich salt on the market today. That's why I love that Baja Gold. And I love saying it because it's like, it's like a, a cool brand of cocaine. Give me that some of that Baja Gold, baby. Like I want the Baja Gold. This you is know? good. We already lost like... Wendy's as a sponsor earlier in this episode. So now you just restored a sponsor for this. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're, they're awesome. And that's, that's literally the only salt that I, that I endorse because it is the most, uh, the world's healthiest sea salt. So if you think about salt, you know, most people are like, what about salt? It's too much sodium, less sodium, but more minerals. So remember m calories, what you weigh macros are how you look micros are how you feel. And micros are what you need to perform more than anything, especially in those races. Being able to draw from a well, a very almost limitless well of energy, fat, all you got to do is keep the micros up. It's much, if anything, it's a much simpler thing as an athlete. Because when I show up to races, and I race uh, on the USA Triathlon uh, Tour pretty regularly, uh, sprint distance, Olympic distance, and uh, half distance iron. I just show up with water bottles with salt in them. I watch everybody else. They're packing their goos and they're pounding, you know, peanut butter and rice cakes and bananas. And like, you know, where am I going to eat this? When am I going to reload, refuel? Which point? Nope. I just show up there. I have, you know, like I'll bring salt packets, have them on my body. I'll have little packets of things that I can crack open, just cheer as I need them. But for the most part, I front load all that. And then just throughout the race, it's just keeping the steady sip going of, little bits of salt here and there, making sure the minerals are, are right and rich, but never having to think about all that extra stuff and having to refuel and replenish and like, okay, my body's doing this with energy. And like, I'm, I'm using, I'm using, I'm using, I'm using. Okay. I need to replenish. I'm using, I'm using. It's like, nope, just holding this steady bit of energy and just making sure the electrolytes are getting continuously replenished. And it's done, it's done me pretty well. I've been, um, either winning my age groups or at least podium, podiuming in the last uh, four races that I've been in. So, I, I mean, I guess I'm doing something right. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's so cool. I mean, not, not for competition, but just for your everyday casual ride to not even think, when was the last time I ate? When was the last time I drank? When I can't remember the last time I filled up a water bottle to take with me on a ride and it it's Salt Lake City. It can be a hundred degrees in the summertime. I could go out <laughs> at 2 p.m. having not eaten for 20 hours and I'll be halfway through my ride and be like, oh yeah, I still don't have a water bottle. I don't even know why I have a water bottle <laughs> cage on my bike. I should save myself the 40 grams and take my carbon fiber bottle cage off my bike because it's absolutely yep. useless. You, yep. you just you don't even consider it. You just go. Yep. I, I've got I've got two of them. I know, I know. Carbon fiber also. I could have saved myself the $70 a That's piece for those things. Too. Saved. <laughs> <laughs> Screw the weight. Yeah, they're expensive. Right. You know, uh, I remember when I was even getting them. I, I forget the brand. Um, starts with an R, German name, I think. But uh, I can't remember the name of the, okay. even the guy at the, the bike shop. He's like, are you sure, man? These are like 70 bucks. I'm like, yeah, carbon, those carbon fiber for sure. Dude. I was like, whatever. They make all you the know, difference. But, the 10 grams you saved on conventional bottle cages. That's the difference. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, I'm right there with you, man. Like I, I do a lot of my, the, the shorter distance races, I do them all fasted, like completely. I mean, all, I do all the races fasted, like a hundred percent. I don't eat until, or I eat a night, the night before I don't eat anything the morning of, uh, I eat all my food the night before and hydrate heavily the night before with a lot of salt. So the water is like seawater the night before. And then the morning of I'm drinking less water, but a lot of salt. So it's, it's like, it's almost unpalatable. It's so salty, but because I'm purposefully retaining water now, I don't want to be drinking more and having to pee or dilute myself with the world's natural solvent of water. So I have a lot of salt with a little bit of water to where I'm just like, ah, like where it's got bite to it. But if you think about it, that's Gatorade. That is literally Gatorade. But if Gatorade were not flavored so sweetly. Gatorade packs what you need for sure. Pedialyte packs what you need for sure. You take the sweetener out of that, it would not taste so good to most people. It would be oh, really strong and salty. And so that's what I go for. So that's what I think of in my mind. I'm like, I'm making my Gatorade and I need that stuff to be 
potent, right? But right there with you. I ran, I've run um, half sprints and Olympic distance, not only fasted, but dry fasted. Like, obviously, I swam in the water, but no, no water on the bike, no water on the run. And then afterwards, I was like, how about that? No water. That was fun. I've run um, half marathons. I've run a full marathon, dry fasted. No water on course. Not a sip, not a drop. And I ran that in, in three hours and 25 minutes. It's awesome. Could have ran better for sure. Yeah. But find me an, you know, a carb heavy athlete that's going to do that. Yep. There's no, I mean, there's just, there's, I don't want to say no way because the human, the body is amazing and the mind is even more amazing. But these, these things like these, they don't just happen. You know, you've got to be in, in this state of, of, of fat adaptation in order to derive the energy to do that. And then at the same time, because you're in that fat adapted state, your body is sucking all that water out. You're definitely get, you definitely get water from your fat. Duh, of course, you get it from the, the glycogen as well. But fat is a great place to suck water from. Your body will do it real well. Anybody that's never dry fasted before, you start doing that and you realize like, wow, I haven't had to pee all day. It's like, yeah, hello, dry fast. You're welcome. You just drank it all. Yeah. But getting up, going for a ride, I'm right there with you. I don't, I don't even pack a bottle anymore. You know, I, I used to always be, all right, let me fill up. Let me get the camel back out. Let me yeah. pour, you know, X amount of scoops of electrolytes in there because we're going for a six-mile jog or whatever. I need to put it in my hand, my handheld water bottle. Like, I went for a 15-miler um, two days ago. It was, you know, 90 five degrees or whatever here. I didn't bring anything. <laughs> I had my, my boonie cover on to block, keep the face out of the sun. And like, other than that, I'm shirts off. Like, let's get some, let's get some active suntan going, babe. Right. I love it. Stop it. Stop here and there at a water fountain uh, throughout town just for a couple of quick sips. But other than that, it's like, dude, we're Gucci, baby. Yeah, that's awesome. And then explain the night before the opposite of what every endurance athlete is ever told to do, carbo-loading. You are loading up your diet, but it's not on carbohydrates. What are you doing the night before? Oh, yeah. So zero carbs and just pure animal fat and protein. I love pre-race tradition going to a Brazilian steakhouse um, and just, you know, eat my fill in picanha. So top sirloin with lots of good fat on it. Beef ribs, as fatty as I can get them from the lamb chops. If they're not the lemon pepper version, I don't, I'll, I just like them with salt. And that's pretty much it. And I just eat until I'm really full and I go to sleep knowing I've got all the energy that I need that'll still be in my stomach the next day to digest and be able to, to draw from. And then I'm for sure I'm wearing it. I'll confirm my ketosis the night before, reconfirm it in the morning for race day. And then I'm just like, and that's just a great surefire method to look and say, dude, you're, you're good. You're good. You, you, you have the confirmed digital reading that you are in an optimal state of nutritional ketosis. Your body is producing ketones. You are deriving energy from those fat stores. Go get them. Yeah. Now it's just up to me to say, all right, are my micronutrients in balance? And that's why I use that heavy salt seawater mix the, the night before. And then really make that, you know, Gatorade the day of. And then it's just sip it on that. Because it's not like I'm going to pour it all into my body in that morning. I don't want to do that because I'm going to have to pee. So I want to load as much of it possible the night before. Get a good pee in the morning. And then maybe one before, you know, gun time or something like that. And then it's just, it's just sipping electrolyte water throughout the race. Just here and there. Just little, just little pinches, little pinches. And that's what's going to keep me in the green. Because if you fall down or you fall back in that, it's really hard to get up from. Yep. You know, you start to cramp or start to have, you know, lactic threshold lockups and stuff in your quads or in the calves. You start to have the, the firings and the adductors, like those pinching cramps, like mm, it's, you can in get there. in a bad spot quick. In there, it's brutal. And then you can't take something fast acting to save you, you know? No. I did it a few years ago. I did a really fast training ride with my team and I did it all fasted carnivore and everything. And towards the end of like 70, 80 miles, I got myself into a really deep, dark spot mm. there. So yeah, that's mm. really good advice to, to, to take that 
um, up front. Um, it's interesting to know as well, obviously a lot of the cyclists that do the Tour de France are eating mixed diets and, and thousands and thousands of calories and lots of carbohydrates, but they also buy up, these teams will buy up hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of ketone esters before the tour. Yep. So they're drinking yep. literally like $100 water bottles because they're full of the ketones because that's just free energy that they can be using while they're also getting energy from carbohydrates. You're just doing that in a natural biological state where they're making a kind of fake biological state by taking exogenous ketones, but they're getting there either way. And I do think it's cool that you were doing so well in triathlon that you have invested in a bike, but the thought of, you know, if I were in a competition and I were to see you pass me on a single speed wearing flip-flops <laughs> while I am totally <laughs> kitted out on a tri bike, I've got my boundless body kit, dude, I would, I would be begging for a bottle of Cytomax to like chuck at you as you pass me. <laughs> True story. Uh, and and to your to your ride, like you said, you're 70, 80 miles into a ride when you, until you started experiencing problems. That's pretty great. Like if, if it took you 70 to 80 miles before you felt cramps, fatigue, or difficulty after having been fasted, maybe not hydrated optimum, it's like it's pretty, it's pretty good too to yeah. be like, okay, I could use some water now. It's like, all right. 70, 80 miles into a, a pretty intense tempo ride, you've probably earned it, you know? So I think that speaks testament uh, also to it, you know, not as a failure at all, but like, hey, that's a great gauge. So like, all right, I got about a probably good 70, 80 miles of hard riding in me with nothing before I might, you know, need something. But it's like, I think that's a pretty good, you know, speaks volumes right there. But yeah, this was a, the Kerrville Triathlon last year. I was just getting onto the circuit. Um, I didn't have my bike that I have now. I didn't have a tri bike. I didn't have shoes. I didn't have clip pedals. Um, it was a single speed road bike <laughs> that I, that I have. It's like my, my city bike, you know, I mean, it's got turned down bars on it, but single speed. So for anybody that, that's no gears, no, no, um, nothing other than just as you can pedal. I did, I do have a free wheel on it. So it's not a fixie. It's not like a true hard ass bike, you know? Um, but I grew up riding, um, or I should say my cycling really started living in, in New York, in Manhattan. And I love the movie premium rush nice. you know, about the delivery, the delivery riders, yeah, right? Nice. Like the, the couriers, dude, they're beasts. Of course they're all on fixies and these little like dwarf bar T bar, you know, no breaks, just like doing it as hard as you can with their huge trains on. But it's very true in the movie when you see them understanding like routes and like how to plan and doing, it's just, it's a very good uh, delve into urban riding because it's, it's just like that. You have to see things way, way, way ahead. You know, it's, things are moving really fast. You get tourists everywhere, people not paying attention, people that should be paying attention, but they aren't paying attention. Cars moving in and like, it's, it's a, it's a really cool exercise. And I did that for years. And so for me, getting into triathlon was, was a pretty good move but I understood like how to move on the bike pretty well. At least I thought I did. I mean, I'm riding these like 50, 60 pound tanks of city bikes. And then I got on my bike, which I can pick up with like two fingers. I'm like, Oh my God, this is going to be a little bit different, but like same <laughs> concept. Okay. So yeah, that first one, I didn't have shoes. I, I wore my flip flops. I did it in a single speed and I was like, ah, it's only a sprint. So it's like a 14 mile, um, bike portion. I was like, I'm just going to hammer this, man. This is my neighborhood. I knew the route well. I know the city. Like, this is my backyard. Like, I'm going to just crush this with tempo. And so I did it and kept, I think it was 19.6 miles per hour was my, my pace throughout. But yeah, and like, and that's on a singles beat, you know, with hills. This is the Texas hill country. It's not like we got a, a ton of them on the route, but it wasn't a zero grade incline. And uh, I remember passing guys that were full, you know, arrow helmeted out, vented shirts you know, full tri bikes, you know, TPI, you know, shifters and electronic pedals, like all the cool stuff. And I'm like geeking out, like, I'm like, oh my God, that's the, do we know the Servalo this, the Quintana <laughs> Row that, like, like, oh my God, Shimano, you know, CDI, like, ah, like I'm geeking out, but I'm passing them. And then on the run or after the run, you know, after the race, they're like, dude, were you the guy in flip flops and no shit? And I didn't have a shirt on like either. Like I just had my helmet, and my, my swim trunks. And they were like, dude, you know, I've had some some shitty things go down in a race, but when a guy passes you and flip flops on a single speed, 
it's kind of demoralizing. And I was like, Oh man, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> like I didn't mean to do that. I'm just like, <laughs> this is what I had. So I just wanted to show up and, and, and have a good time and it ended up being um, kind of a funny story. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I would definitely be throwing a water bottle at you. That's <laughs> fantastic. I love that story. Jake, this has been an awesome conversation. I've really enjoyed chatting with you. There's been a lot of really good practical um, information that you've given us. Um, but also I, I really think your story is very inspiring and I think it can motivate a lot of people to really prioritize their health more so than they are now. Um, it, it's tough out there. We are all cocaine addicts in a cocaine infested world when it comes to sugar and it's, yeah. it's pretty tough. It's tough out there. So yeah. I think your information is really great. And again, very inspirational. Where would you like people to go to find you to connect with you and your work? Oh, for sure. All, all the social channels are life like Jake. So everything's at life like Jake. All my my merch uh, for the brand, the label that I started last year, Life Like Us, because as much as I say it's Life Like Jake, it's really Life Like You, so that makes it Life Like Us. All the merch that I wear all the time, the Make Milk Raw Again shirts, the Save the Great White Shark, Ban Lab Grown Meat, about to drop now. Uh, this week, you'll see. Um, that's at thelifelikeus.com. Excellent. We will tag all of that in the notes. And like I said, Jake, it was such a pleasure to meet you and to meet your mom and to hang out in Austin for Hack Your Health. It was such a great time, but I really, it, it was an honor to finally host you on the show and learn from you. And, and you've shared so many great tips with us. So thank you so very much for everything that you do. And thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to do this. We really, really appreciate you. Same. Thanks for having me on, Casey. I'll tell my mother hello for you. <laughs> Please do. That'd be great. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio. Thank you so very much for listening to and supporting Boundless Body Radio. This podcast is such a passion of mine, one of my favorite parts about running our business, and none of this would be possible without our incredible guests and listeners like yourself. Thank you so, so very much for all of the amazing reviews that we get on Apple and Spotify. Trust me, we read them all, and it means the world to hear that you are enjoying the show as well. I am very excited to announce that this summer, I will be hosting a nutrition seminar series. This is actually a project that I started after I became certified as a nutrition coach. I wanted to get a group of people together to discuss all aspects of human nutrition. And as a bonus, I did the whole thing outside by a pool, which was great. After the pandemic, I stopped hosting the series, but this year I've decided to bring it back. Each week, we'll have a particular topic and an agenda. We'll have outlines that include references and also meal plans, guest appearances, book giveaways, and more, all for free. For those of you who live in the Salt Lake City area, the seminars will be hosted every Tuesday at noon, starting on May 28th, and will run all the way until September 3rd. The seminar will be hosted outside, of course, at the beautiful Bowery Park in Daybreak, where I live. If you're available and in the area, we would absolutely love to see you there. If you are unable to attend, either that day and time does not work for you, or you don't live in the area, the good news for you as well, we are going to put all the recordings and post them on YouTube, where you can submit listener questions in the comment section, which we can address in future seminars. I'm also including all of the seminar materials on our website, so you don't have to miss out on the content. My goal is to make a comprehensive yet simple understanding of nutrition so that anybody confused about how they should eat can create a framework for themselves based on their individual goals. As I said, if you're interested in participating, we'd love to have you. If you can't make it into the in-person seminar, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also our website at myboundlessbody.com slash seminar to find all the resources, videos, and a fun quiz. Either way, thank you as always for listening to Boundless Body Radio.